This episode celebrates the anniversary of a record flight set by the Airwood F5 Bees airplane. This is a modified version of the Airwood F5, which was built for Stanisław Skarżyński to make an attempt of transatlantic record flight. In order for the record to be official, the plane had to fit into one of four categories which were set by the FAI uh, for sports planes. Here you can see the details of those categories. And as we may know, the Airwood F5 was close to the category number two. Record version of the plane had to be a single seater and it, uh, and it needed to have the range of at least about 4000 kilometers. So the modifications which were obvious were additional fuel tanks. First fuel tank was fitted behind the pilot's seat. Normally there was a second cockpit there, but this record version had a 300 liter aluminum fuel tank. Uh, this was a controversial solution, because back at those days placing a tank behind the seat was considered very dangerous. Uh, obviously in case of a, a rollover, of a turnover of an airplane, uh, this, uh, um, this tank was feared to, uh, to crush the pilot. So for example Charles Lindbergh, for his transatlantic flight, uh, chose the fuel tank to be in front of him, which m meant that the plane had no forward visibility. And Lindbergh chose to fly with no visibility, to use only instruments and a, a submarine-like periscope uh, was in front of the airplane, rather than to fly uh, an airplane which had a fuel tank behind him. Standard uh, Airwood F5 um, was a high wing uh, layout airplane. It had two fuel tanks in the wing and the record version Bees was equipped with another two. So eventually we ended up with an airplane which had four fuel tanks in the wing, 113 liter each and additional largest fuel tank, 300 liters behind the pilot's seat. And this largest tank had um, fuel pump which was manually operated. Uh, Skarżyński thought that it is a good solution because it is the most reliable and it is um, also, uh, let's say, a source of something to do for the pilot during the flight which took many hours. Back in those days emergency fuel dump was also available, uh, but it was achieved by single-use valves which were made of rubber and shellac. Once they were open, uh, they could not be closed again, and in case of ditching, the plane was left with open fuel tanks which could take in water and cause the plane to sink. So it was decided that the safer version would be to make the tanks with no option of emergency fuel dumping. Uh, what's more, Skarżyński calculated himself that uh, after just three hours of flight, uh, the plane would consume enough fuel uh, to stay afloat in case of ditching. What's more, if pilot wanted to dump fuel because of the engine failure, there was high risk of the dumped fuel catching fire. Apart from enlarged fuel tanks, the plane also was equipped with an enlarged oil tank, which, depending on the source, had 30 or 35 liters capacity. It was below the pilot's legs, basically. Those modifications ensured a theoretical range of 5000 kilometers, but at the cost of weight issues. Here you can see the calculation. Production version of Edvo D5 weighed 460 kilograms. Additional tanks empty added 190 kilograms, and the legal weight for the record of the empty airplane was 450 kilograms. Uh, the actual weight of the plane was 446. So we have a difference of 204 kilograms. Lack of second pilot decreased the weight by 75 kilograms, so we still have too much by 129 kilograms. So as we see, Ervu D5 Bis was not a modified version of standard Ervu D5. It was a nearly scratch-built airplane with same uh, dimensions and uh, aerodynamical uh, principles, but when it comes to its construction, it had to be designed from scratch to achieve such a significant weight reduction in a small airplane. Ervo D5 Bs had a takeoff weight higher by 340 kilograms 
uh, compared to its standard version and it had to be accelerated on the runway to over 100 km per hour. This made um, the runway, uh, the necessary runway very long because the airplane had fixed pitch propeller which was optimized uh, to be the most uh, efficient at cruising speed which was about 175 km per hour. Therefore Skarżyński didn't take full fuel tanks for the transatlantic flight. Cockpit had additional compass, shock absorbed seat, additional armrest and footrests on rudder pedals which enhanced pilot's comfort. It was important in this very case because Skarżyński had been wounded during the war and uh, his health status was not the best. In fact he was considered nearly a disabled person by some so his comfort was very important. The cockpit also had additional light but not of a standard type. What Skarżyński in fact used was a medical type headlamp like this one which had cables and a 14 hour dry battery in the pocket. It worked like this. And this was used by Skarżyński to uh, illuminate the cockpit. He praised this solution for illuminating the direction he was facing. Airplane had the Havilland Gypsy motor uh, with hanging cylinders. Its horsepower varies between 120 and 135 horsepower depending on the source but maybe this is the difference between the nominal and maximum power and maybe this is the the, the higher horsepower uh, is the output of the special version of the motor because it was ordered especially for the record uh, airplane at the Havilland and the Havilland company in fact um, sent one mechanic to service the uh, record engine before the flight attempt. Obviously the record success would be also a great um, advertisement for the reliability of the Havilland engines. The engine also didn't have a typical muffler uh, which added horsepower but the cabin um, required additional sound insulation. Power to weight ratio was calculated in such a way that uh, insulating the cabin would be more beneficial than using a standard muffler. There was also controversy if the plane had port door. The answer is it didn't have. Here are the pictures to prove that. For a long time there were serious publications stating that there is no photo of the plane's left side. Uh, I have come across such a photo and here I show it so we can see that the plane had only one starboard side door. Plane was first flown on March 28, 1934 and long distance tests flights were performed over Poland. Why was the plane made was kept secret. Skarżyński didn't want any rumor about his record attempt. He wanted to have the full decision whether to fly or not and be able to withdraw even at the last moment with no pressure from media or the society. It is of course hard to hide uh, the reason of building an airplane capable of covering uh, 5000 kilometers. Uh, so the official version was that there will be a record attempt but not transatlantic. Uh, Skarżyński was said to uh, take off from Senegal in Africa and fly north for example uh, on the route from St. Louis to Lyon in France or similar. Actually Skarżyński once studied a map with his mates and then his wife Julia entered the room and she saw a map of the Atlantic on the table so she asked what is this all about and they made up an explanation that Skarżyński is going to fly along um, Africa's coast and he has to be familiar with coastline which is best depicted on the map uh, accidentally also showing the rest of the Atlantic. Also aviation commander of the time, General uh, Ludomił Rajski, uh, believed that all aircraft works in Poland should be state owned and uh, RWD was a very well uh, organized private company. So success of a private company was also not to his content. But another general, Gustav Orlicz Drescher, uh, supported Skarżyński and uh, he wished him well and uh, kept saying that the only drawback of this uh, transatlantic record flight is that he cannot fly along with Skarżyński.
Skarżyński was very well prepared in terms of meteorology. He knew all the cycles of Passat winds, um, the rules of uh, rain and dry uh, period, and uh, military uh, meteorological service uh, made a great contribution by creating uh, proper maps, which was also made uh, in secret. Having everything ready, Skarżyński flew from Poland, from Warsaw to Senegal and on the way he sent a letter to RWD company stating Maszyna doskonała, this means the machine is perfect. The FAI committee awaited Skarżyński in Senegal to confirm that the airplane meets all the rules and there was the official uh, weighing of the airplane. And uh, what turned out is that the plane is by 16 kilograms too heavy. So uh, Skarżyński questioned the uh, proper functioning of the scale and those officials said that it is possible that the scale is not properly working, which is strange in itself. There was even a plan to uh, fly the airplane to Paris for official uh, weighing, uh, but finally it turned out that there was some fraction of fuel left in the tanks, they could not be emptied by 100%, and this added 16 kilograms to uh, plane weight. Obviously the weight stated by the rules is the weight of an empty airplane, the dry weight we can say. After confirming that everything was okay with the plane, Skarżyński revealed the transatlantic route. Committee at once called it suicidal, but on the other hand, the official route was no better. Skarżyński had to fly over desert, uh, which was, uh, let's say, owned by the Bedouin tribes. Uh, then there were Atlas Mountains, uh, rocky coastline of Spain. Uh, so if it came to emergency landing, there was uh, no better chance of survival than uh, on the Atlantic. Or the risk was nearly the same. Officials pointed out further issues. First of all, how to fly using only the compass. Uh, it's, it's not a precise device. Uh, standard of navigation over the sea was using the sextant. Sextant looks like this. But, as Skarżyński said, the use of sextant requires both hands and he has no co-pilot to fly the plane at the time. And using the sextant requires finding the heavenly bodies, the stars, and the RWD 5Bs has no sunroof. Okay, so how to fly without the radio? In the era, there was a basic radio navigation. It, it, was, it was possible to find a direction where to fly based on radio waves, uh, but uh, Skarżyński said that uh, flying with the use of radio navigation is not a sport, uh, and compared it to uh, driving a railroad locomotive uh, along the uh, tracks. Uh, and uh, what's more important, the lightest available radio equipment uh, was 60 kilograms heavy, so it's a large percent of the gross weight of this tiny airplane. Go on then, how to fly with no parachute? Uh, Skarżyński said that in case of any failure he would have to ditch, and in case of ditching parachute may only cause additional danger of drowning, so parachute is not important. Okay, so how to fly with no life raft, no dinghy? Skarżyński said that he doesn't have dinghy, but he has a rubber inflatable cushion on his seat, which is evenly good. Uh, in fact, uh, I have tested it myself. What would be the use of a dinghy? So let's imagine Skarżyński actually ditching into the Atlantic. Having gotten out from the aircraft, he would have to use an inflatable life raft, a, a dinghy, similar to the one I'm sitting in right now. This is a Cold War era device, but sort design of a dinghy didn't change much over the course of the years. It is packed into container similar to this one. Uh, this weighs about five pounds. You would have to take it out of the airplane, get it inflated. You probably can see right here behind me there is a uh, there is a pocket in which there was uh, initially a um, a bottle with a pressurized gas like uh, CO2 or, or or air, which would inflate the dinghy. But it uh, it is difficult because uh, while inflating it 
too quickly in cold water, this dinghy could get punctured or badly damaged. Then inside here, having completed the initial um, fill up, we have a pump which is used for, uh, let's say, keeping the pressure of the dinghy um, on a proper level, but you cannot inflate the dinghy uh, from null uh, using this pump. You also have a device to uh, take the water out of the dinghy and you have a little chute which is like indication of, of the wind. Uh, it's right now not very windy here and, and it's, it's wet but it's well a drifting drifting uh, chute. Uh, we also have in this container a, a repair kit. Uh, should the dinghy get damaged we have um, a sort of screws which we then screw into the uh, into the puncture and uh, save ourselves uh, in this way. I also have a little um, pedal but obviously it's uh, it's necessary for me to make this movie for you but uh, orig original uh, original dinghy did not have any sort of a, a pedal uh, on board. This dinghy is capable of carrying up to 90 kilograms that is about 200 pounds uh, and the device itself weighs about 5 pounds. Skarżyński was very well prepared for the flight, even in terms of food he took aboard. Take a look. All food he took was soft. This is crispy. Whenever I eat it, I create a sound which may be mistaken for an engine malfunction. And after proving that the airplane flies thanks to Bernoulli's, not Marconi's, principle. On May the 7th, Captain Pilot Stanisław Skarżyński on Sierra Papa Alpha Juliet Uniform RWD-5 Bs airplane took off for successful transatlantic flight and after 20 and a half hours, having covered 3,582 kilometers, he landed in Maceo Airfield in Brazil, setting the record flight for 450 kilogram airplane category. He also became the first Polish aviator to fly across the Atlantic. He wrote a book about history of his uh, transatlantic flight. We get to know many interesting facts reading it. For example, this is how Skarżyński was greeted in Maceo Airfield. Rzeczywiście trudno zaimponować tym Amerykanom. Dobrze, że chociaż kawą poczęstowali. To prawda! And there was something to impress the Americans. Uh, Transatlantic flight in such a small airplane was a record in itself, but also the navigation was stunning. In fact, um, Skarżyński missed the ideal point of crossing the Brazilian coastline by 15 kilometers. This means that for every kilometer he covered, he was off the track by 4 meters. So even if he had uh, the above mentioned sextant, uh, he would be able to navigate with the accuracy of about 30 kilometers. Average speed of the flight was 183 kilometers per hour, so also not that low. Skarżyński later had to make a tour around South America. He was not the kind of celebrity, so it was very exhausting for him. He mentioned it many times, especially that at all airfields he was greeted. There were performances, concerts, interviews. Uh, and he also got a, a congratulations letter from his wife, Julia. Here you can see her writing the letter to her husband, which was later sent to Buenos Aires. Here you can see the South American tour plan. Uh, there was one incident in Curitiba airfield. A uh, crowd gathered in such way that uh, Skarżyński had to make a landing approach from um, disadvantageous direction and airplane got damaged. 
the mount of a shock absorber uh, went loose and the airplane made something which we may call a half belly landing but uh, please notice that uh, neither the propeller nor the engine were damaged in such a situation. The plane was quickly fixed and continued the trip. At one of the further airfields Skarzyński was criticized for uh, saluting uh, officers with two fingers like this um, but it is not uh, a mean of any disrespect. Uh, as far as I know in the whole world only the Polish soldier salutes with two fingers. After the tour RWD-5Bs along with Skarzyński arrived to Europe on board the Avila Star steamer. Here you can see the box in which the plane was shipped. On the way home Skarzyński calculated that the cost of the transatlantic flight was $1403 but this cost does not include fuel as the plane uh, would be flying anyway if not over the Atlantic then over uh, Poland or other country. Asked by the journalists he said that the most difficult part of the whole record uh, route was the road from uh, Warsaw to Okęcie airport because there was cobblestone and it was very bumpy and shaky and asked if the uh, flight was difficult he said that not because for Poles everything is easy. Plane was obviously rigged ashore and Skarzyński flew to Poland. He stopped in the city of Łódź for a moment uh, to take a break uh, and he uh, says that he once even stood next to people who were reading newspapers uh, and newspapers headlines said where is Captain Skarzyński? People kept searching for him, awaiting his arrival. Uh, obviously few knew uh, how did he look like. On the final way uh, to Okęcie airport, uh, to Warsaw, uh, Skarzyński's plane was accompanied by Polish fighters, uh, which was a very emotional moment for him. Uh, it all took place after a uh, few months after a tragic death of Polish aviation heroes Żwirko and Wigura. And here, thanks to Skarzyński, Polish wings again uh, stood strong and Poland had a great international nation-binding uh, aviation success. rwd 5 b was called Americanka, this means the American lady, and was uh, retrofitted with second seat and as a twin-seater uh, given to Skarzyński as a gift from the Polish society. At the outbreak of Second World War the airplane was taken over by the Soviet army in Lwów airfield uh, and its um, further fate uh, remains unknown. Uh, as the fate of thousands of people uh, taken into the Soviet Union. Skarzyński had to face wide waters once again. During the Second World War he was the pilot of the RAF bomber uh, Vickers Wellington uh, and here is how one of his crew members uh, remembers the final flight of Skarzyński's crew. We ditched a battle damaged Wellington in the dark. The plane sank rapidly. We found out our pilot was not in the life raft with us. He must have been washed to the left or his disability would not allow him to reach the dinghy. We heard some whistling. I'm not sure where from. It was Skarzyński. He responded to our calls. His voice went quiet and eventually faded. After the sunrise, there was no trace of our commander on the quiet sea. 